Okay, London, Vienna, Moscow, and St. Petersburg uh, online. So this is Joker mm -hmm. uh, broadcast number one. Uh, hello, Peter. Hello, Sebastian. Hello, Sergey. Hi, everybody. Good. So uh, before we start, Peter, I have a. Uh, I promise you that I have a small surprise. Uh, do you have any idea about what is this? Um, no, because. <laughs> I'm okay. See what you're this to. is. This oh, is. Oh yes, a, yes. Ah, uh, what is this? Uh, is that a, is that a drive I gave you? Absolutely. This is a USB flash card with the Chronicle software, uh, which you presented me several years ago, probably on JCrete, correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, gentlemen, it's a great honor for us to have you on board this year, and the seat from my side and the broadcast is yours. Thank you. Right. So. Um, Today's talk is about some of the novel things that we do in Java code. Uh, um, we There's many things that you could do in theory, and I've written many articles about odd pieces of code that you know happen to compile or happen to work, but very lit few of them you would say, well, this is something we would use in reality. Um, however, um, these are uh, some things that we that are a bit odd and novel that we actually use in reality and in particular use in our open source code. So we have some other tricks that we use in our closed source, but today I'm focusing just on the open source so you can see um, this code yourself. Uh, a quick way to find it is in many cases, you can Google things like class names or whatever to find um, the actual uh, full source for these examples. So uh, one of the things that uh, I think we do, which is quite novel, is that we have a class that extends throwable. And by extending throwable, we, we, we're not extending either runtime exception, exception, or error. This is directly uh, extending throwable. Why is this? Well, what this is, is a container for a stack trace, which is what a throwable does. Uh, and it has a message. And so it, it seemed natural for us to reuse this class. And it has a number of benefits, which I will show you. But um, one of them being, uh, for example, in, uh, in you can see that you can take uh, a stack trace from another thread and populate the stack trace of the, um, this, this throwable, which is a stack trace, uh, and um, record it. Um, you can't, it's not just for recording, you can also use it um, for uh, reporting and monitoring. And um, so here's some examples. Um, in the example I have below, I'm passing through uh, a stack trace that I record in one place to say where a resource was created. And later I can um, produce a meaningful error message which shows not only a stack trace of where it complained, uh, in this case, um, complaining that this component was discarded without being closed appropriately, but also I can include a stack trace as a cause, uh, which is where, where was this object created? Now, the use case here is that um, when you have an object that needs to be cleaned up uh, correctly, um, deterministically, not just relying on the GC, um, it uh, can be very useful if it's if it's got a resource leak uh, to determine where was this uh, object created in the first place, because that can often um, help you work out well if it was created here, it should have been uh, freed up there. Um, so we can really help trace down well why why is it that I've got this component which is supposed to be closed but it's not being closed. Um, and you'll notice that because uh, created the stack trace extends throwable, it can be a, a, um, a cause to another exception. And when this is uh, logged out, you see the stack trace of, in this case, the illegal state exception, followed by the stack trace of where uh, the object was created. Uh, another example is um, also tracing where was an object closed. So a common problem you have is that when you try to use an object after it's been closed, and you want, and um, a common behavior is, well, it will just complain that the object was closed, but that doesn't tell you, well, okay, so why was it closed? Where, where in the code was it closed? 
because um, was it closed in another thread? Was it closed in the same thread? But there's some sort of coding issue. It, it can be difficult to diagnose where, where and why was it closed. Well, in this case, what we can do is uh, when tracing is enabled, we can record a stack trace. And as you can see, this is a stack trace. It's never intended to be thrown. But um, however, it is very easy and convenient to then complain, well, uh, I'm trying to use a resource that was closed. And here was where it was closed. So I've now got the cause for my illegal state exception, which itself can be a stack trace uh, in a different piece of code and even in a different thread, because the stack trace um, uh, also records which thread created the stack trace. Uh, so we can see uh, in this example, we can see um, both the, where um, it was attempted to be used, even though it was closed, but we can also see which thread closed it and where was it closed? What was the stack trace that triggered these closed in the first place? So, um, so even though uh, it's, it's a little bit surprising that stack trace extends throwable, it's actually surprisingly useful. Um, another area we use it in is um, when uh, we want to record uh, uh, threads that shouldn't be running are still running. Um, and there may be many threads. So uh, in this case, we go through a loop uh, to find all the threads that shouldn't uh, be running and, and we filter them out. And for every thread that is still running, we can take a stack trace. Um, we get a thread dump, um, turn it into a stack trace, and then we can add it as a suppressed um, uh, exception for a single stack uh, exception. So we, we create an exception which says, there are threads still running. And then attached to that exception has all of the stack traces for every thread that's still running. So uh, one of the nice features of, um, of, a, of stack traces is that you can add a multiple other, uh, 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 one of the benefits of an exception is you can add multiple other throwables um, as the cause for this exception. And, and it really is the cause, uh, the cause of me throwing an exception now is because there are other threads that shouldn't be running. Uh, and these threads are the stack trace of those threads to show you what is it doing, right? To give you an idea of why is it still running? Is it locked up in something? Is it sitting in the loop and it's just not realized that it should die? Or, you know, what is it doing? Why, why is this thread that shouldn't be running still running? Um, we can add that as a suppressed, um, uh, ex uh, uh, throwable associated with the exception we're now going to throw, which is saying that there's threads still running. Um, so before I move on to another topic, um, is there any questions about extending throwable to create a stack trace? There is no question so far in the chat, so this is a reminder um, for everybody just to ask questions. But I would have a question actually regarding uh, these stack trace and, and tracing objects. Um, did you face any issues with recent Java versions or anything since Java 9, since uh, on a previous slide you used things like unsafe? And does it still work if you rewrite the code a little bit in a recent Java version? Um, we've tested our code in Java 14. Um, so it works there. Um, we've not uh, tested since then, but uh, this particular feature, I wouldn't expect to, there to be a problem uh, uh, in terms of Java versions. What you do get, you do get some some issues with it. Uh, one is that um, because this um, will only take a stack trace at a safe point, if you've got some tight code, like a tight arithmetic loop, or um, you've got some code where um, a large section has been optimized out. Uh, when you take the stack trace, it's only when it eventually reaches a safe point, which could be a little bit misleading as to what it's even doing um, or why uh, a thread is busy. Um, so uh, that, that's a downside. And we, we have a solution for that later as to um, how to add explicit safe points um, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you think that this is a problem. Um, if, if, does anyone else have a question? Actually, I have, uh, not a question, but some comment about your, um, way how you, uh, track, um, 
uh, track how objects uh, are used. Actually, it's quite interesting thing uh, here, uh, what uh, I'm talking about, that uh, garbage collector addresses only issues of memory man management, but we have a lot of objects which we have to trace their life cycle and uh, somehow manage that. And actually, since garbage collector solves only one uh, think of uh, memory uh, memory management only uh, memory management but we have a lot of resources to have manual life cycle and I think uh, what what Peter uh, show, uh, shows here it's quite interesting uh, way to uh, to debug such issues yes uh, and one of the important details is that um, we've got I mean you can see the code we use as a parent class that uses this but um, one of the uh, important details is that we make it extremely lightweight when you turn off resource tracing. So all of this disappears uh, when you um, when you don't need it, and by default, uh, if you use these libraries. Uh, so the library itself has it turned on, but then if you use the library uh, by default, it's turned off, and so uh, the overhead is very low. So it's really about diagnosing resource leaks. Um, a common example that we come across is that we um, we keep files open for long periods of time. So a file channel or random random access file, we keep them open for a long period of time, like typically an hour, possibly a day. And we want to make sure that um, those files are not kept open when they're no longer needed. And in particular, this shows up in Windows because you can't delete a file if it thinks uh, that resource is still being used. So uh, if, if you're trying to delete a file because you're trying to release space, but you, you're prevented from doing so because of a resource leak, uh, we need to be able to pick that up. Um, and we can't just rely on uh, try with resource because uh, this is a very long lived um, um, resource. Uh, it's not just used temporarily and then closed. Uh, and we yeah, have we other have, resources uh, that are like that. Yeah, we have to manage a life cycle of the, uh, such objects somehow fully manual way. And it is the issue here. Okay. So, so if you have a look in our code, we also have um, the ability to check on every unit test that everything is cleaned up correctly, including any threads that were started get shut down, uh, any resources that are deterministic uh, get closed off. Um, we have a background releaser thread so that you're not forced to close off resources um, in the current thread. However, you also, when you do this check, you want to make sure that the background releaser has done its job so that you don't fail uh, spuriously. So I have a little question for people to think about. Um, stack trace, if it extends throwable, is it checked or unchecked? All right, I'll give you, I'll give you the answer. So um, all all things that ex directly extend throwable are checked. It's only uh, error and runtime exception where it's not checked. Um, so it, we we also have implicitly um, ensuring that stack trace itself is never actually thrown anywhere. Shall I move on? I think so. Okay. I think yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so another thing that we do, which is a little bit unusual, more than a little bit unusual, is um, we have support what I call um, uh, dynamic enums, or uh, more technically is a pass by name for um, serialization. So an example we have here is that we've got um, a number of enums that we use where uh, there is a pre-canned um, uh, number of IDs and that will have some pre canned data associated with them. However, um, we may want to change uh, a couple of things about them. Uh, so one of the things that we might change is what is the data associated with that enum, but um, also what, uh, what the enums are themselves. So uh, in some cases, we want to be able to, so for example, we, we've got, um, in this case, uh, these are ECNs, um, for connecting uh, market data and orders, but we may want to add one without having to restart the server and upgrade the software. 
So we want the ability of uh, compile time binding and compile time checking for all of the known ECNs, but at the same time, we still want the ability to add one. So uh, the way we support that is, um, so this is an example where we, we have the ability to add one, where in this case, uh, this is um, uh, the format we typically use when we're dumping to text our, our serialized data. So we use YAML. And as you can see, um, uh, in this case, uh, there's an exclamation mark in front of ECN to show the type um, of uh, the data. Uh, so in this case, um, we're updating an existing one. So uh, par FX is uh, one of the existing ones. And um, this will have the effect of changing its priority. Now, in this case, we're serializing a new new data for um, uh, an enum, which will change its fields because it already exists. Um, however, when, uh, most of the time, we will be referring to this ECN by name. Um, so it's passed by name. So. Uh, this is how e enums are typically serialized. Um, it's usually the string associated, the string name of the ECN, which is, or the sort of the enum, which is serialized. And um, that data is what's put in the wire. So this, regardless of the format we're talking about, whether it's Java serialization or, um, uh, you know, uh, XML or JSON, it's usually just the string that's associated with the um, enum, which is, which is written out. Um, and, and this is the default behavior. However, we've also added the ability to um, add additional uh, enums um, for serialization purposes, as well as alter the data and fields to do with those ACNs. Now, because this is quite powerful and obviously quite dangerous, um, we do add the requirement that there's an interface that the enum needs to implement if it's going to um, uh, support this functionality. Um, at the same time, it's not restricted to enums. It's supported for enums, and that's generally how it's used. But uh, if you're uncomfortable using enums or it's not appropriate, it will also work on regular classes as well. Do we have any, any questions about that? Actually, we have a question uh, regarding QR handles. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, what do you miss? Um, what do you miss in QR handles? What still forces you using unsafe? Maybe a question of, of for the Zoom discussion. So, feel free to answer uh, here. I or... can give. Yeah, I can give you a quick answer. Um, so, for me personally, uh, the feature which uh, I would most like this to see is uh, proper 64-bit address sizes. So that's one of the things we do in our bytes is we have 64-bit address sizes. Uh, Chronicle map, for example, creates a single memory mapping of whatever size it needs to be. And it could be 128 terabytes and you just create one big mapping into, into virtual memory and you just access it continuously. Um, that's, that's one of the features I would most like to see. We can work around it in reality, we can just create lots and lots and lots of um, memory mappings of, say, a gigabyte. So for 128 terabytes, we just have to create 128,000 memory mappings and break up the memory. And um, you know, um, it, it can be done, but it's a bit unpleasant. Um, however, the biggest thing that stops us is uh, it's not that, is that uh, most of our clients are still on Java 8. So any feature which is not backported to Java 8, we can't really use, um, we can't rely upon. So we can use it uh, in the for clients who aren't on Java 8, but for, we have to have a solution that also works in Java 8. May I answer you one more question? Uh, sure. You why your clients are still at Java uh, uh, Java 8 uh, and uh, are not moving forward I mean is there any any uh, any features of that or it's just um, or it's just a, a, a habit of uh, your customers yeah so a lot of our paying clients are uh, in fact most of our paying clients by revenue are tier one banks and they are inherently conservative and um, 
as far as I can see, they've not seen any compelling features in Java 11, for example, which makes it worth upgrading to. Um, some of our clients are on Java 11, uh, but they tend to be um, other financial institutions such as cryptocurrencies, cr cryptocurrency exchanges. They're much more inclined to um, pick up Java 11 and um, use it. Um, none are post Java 11 yet. Uh, I think the most likely one that they will, anyone will pick up and use in production will, for our clients will be Java 17, which I believe is their next long time supported um, release. Um, and at that point, um, maybe some of the banks will move off Java 8, maybe go to Java 11, uh, considering it to be stable. But um, yeah, it'll be a long time before until we've got to the point where none of our paying clients are still on Java 8. Okay, thank you. I think we could move forward. Sure. So, um, so you, so another little question for uh, that I'm asking myself is uh, how do you add, how do you create a new enum? And uh, the way that we do is we use um, unsafe allocate instance which allows you to do that. So obviously you can't do it with constructor new instance. It prevents you from creating an instance of an enum, but uh, unsafe allocate instance does allow you to do that. Um, and then we have to add, um, we have to create an ordinal for it that's unique. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so one of, one of the things which has been contentious from time to time is making use of double. So there are some people that feel that uh, big decimal is the right approach. However, um, uh, I certainly the long the, the more I've seen issues to do with big double, the less um, I think that it's really the answer. So so uh, so that's may, maybe just an opinion of myself. Um, certainly, um, all the trading systems that um, are using C++. Um, they're not using big double because it doesn't exist. They're uh, a big decimal, sorry. They're not using big decimal because it doesn't exist. Um, in C Sharp, uh, a lot of trading systems are using a decimal, um, which is a built-in type in C Sharp. And uh, more lightweight, not only has better language support than um, big decimal, but also is in some ways more lightweight. So it has some advantages which would make it appealing. But um, uh, certainly in Java, I think um, my, my opinion is not only is double faster, but it's actually uh, less error prone. So let's just have a little look. At, so however, the thing to be aware of is that obviously with uh, if you're going to use double is you need to use appropriate rounding. And um, so we have some methods that have faster versions of how to round to a fixed precision. And this is one of them. So here is a comparison of um, using double versus big decimal across uh, a number of versions of Java. And you can see that there's um, an order of magnitude difference uh, if there's a heavy calculation involving uh, big decimal. However, that's not, uh, for me, the biggest issue. So this one you can quantitatively do a comparison with. For me, the biggest issue is uh, around um, not only language support, which is something that I still don't think is on the cards yet, um, but also, and this is, a, this is one, one area where Kotlin which is better, of course, uh, but also um, when you have an issue um, with double, it's much more apparent. So say you have a representation error, and we've all seen this, uh, you end up with an answer that's got zero 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 one or two. Or it's got nine 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 at the end, right? So it's obvious not only that um, you've got a representation error or an arithmetic error, but it's also generally obvious what it should be, right? Because um, it clearly should have been rounded and the value should be whatever. However, with big decimal, if you make a coding mistake, uh, you will still end up with what looks like a sensible answer. So a simple example, which is something we actually I've actually come across in our code base at one point, 
was um, dividing uh, a number by seven and then later multiplying by seven. So say you take the number one and you divide by seven and then multiply by seven. If you're not careful, you can end up with 0.98, um, for example. Uh, and 0.98 looks right. Uh, there's nothing inherently, uh, in, unless you know the context of how it was calculated, you could look at 0.98 and think, Oh, yeah, that, that looks fine, right? It's not obviously wrong. Um, and that that's, um, so language support aside, um, in some ways, Big Decimal is more error prone because um, you can have problems and not actually know what, what the problem was or what it should have been. Um, and, uh, and so, so we, we more all around, we generally favor using double um, partly for performance, but also it's less error prone, in, at least in my opinion. Do you have any questions on that topic? Okay. All right, I'll move on. So one of the problems that we have is that um, we have uh, a number of resources that uh, we want to cache in thread locals, but these are resources that need to be cleaned up deterministically. Um, so we have a, a sort of a catch-22 problem that um, thread locals by default don't do this. Um, they don't, um, they rely on the GC to clean up um, the resource. <clears throat> and unless the GC does clean it up correctly, um, you end up with a resource leak um, in your thread locals. Another problem is that even if the GC does clean it up, it's not deterministic. You don't know at what point it's going to clean it up or run, if ever. Um, and certainly in our in the sort of systems we run, you want ideally you want to have a minor collection or a no collections for um, maybe 24 hours. So you can end up with a resource leak that lasts for a very long time. Um, uh, because you're waiting for a GC. Uh, and in particular, um, so for example, if you go back to my previous example of having files, um, even if the GC does clean up your file handles, um, you can run out of file handles long before you run out of memory because the limit uh, on some systems might be only a few thousand. So you might open and close a few thousand files long before you've, you've triggered a, a GC to occur. Um, and so we have a mechanism for handling that. What we do is all of our threads um, have this very simple cleaning thread wrapper. And essentially what happens is that on shutdown, um, which is after the thread has done its job running whatever it needs to do, it goes and um, it looks through, uses reflection, unfortunately, but um, it's, that's the only way to get it is it goes through all of the um, thread locals um, in the thread uh, and looks to see if any of them are a cleaning thread local. So again, you have to use cleaning thread local instead of just ordinary thread local. But if you do, then um, it will deterministically call a method which allows it to be uh, released on um, shutdown. So this way, any thread when it shuts down can make sure that all the resources that it's using that can be released deterministically are released deterministically when the thread dies. And it's done by the thread that's doing it, uh, that's doing the shutdown. So it's not a thread that's either got something more useful to be doing. So it doesn't matter if, if that also takes a little bit of time, like maybe you know many milliseconds or maybe even a second. Um, it doesn't really matter because it's a, like I said, it's a thread that's dying anyway. Does anyone have any questions about that? Not on that for now, we, but we do have a question regarding the previous example. Um, why don't sure. you use long for calculations? The person asks, I've heard in LMAX group, they use longs everywhere and check with some uh, annotations. Yes, so you can use long instead of using double. And that has, um, in fact, big decimal by now, um, or for a long time, as you use a long if possible for smaller values which they generally are. 
Um, the problem with using a long by itself is that um, you have essentially a fixed precision. So you can do this for prices, you can do this for quantities, um, and um, you then have to apply a fixed precision. So then if you multiply them together, you get a result which also has a fixed precision um, that you need to know what it is. Um, the problem there is what is the cost of a bug? Now, if you use double, the cost of a bug is you can end up with a number which may get rejected downstream, um, or it might get rounded off to the value it probably should have been anyway. Um, and um, the the cost of uh, of a rounding issue isn't isn't very high. However, if you're using fixed precision, the cost could be very high. So, if say you get it wrong, and the number is 10 times or 100 times what it should have been. Um, that the cost, you only need one bug like that to be pretty catastrophic um, in terms of costing your company a lot of money. Um, and um, so it, it's really about, um, you know, what, what is the worst that could happen <laughs> in some cases. And uh, certainly uh, you don't want to be, uh, have a, a fixed precision error where the code is out by some factor of what it should have been. Um, certainly if it's like the smallest factor, it could be, well, it could be too small, which is probably fine, or it's not too bad. But if it's too large, um, you know, um, trading 10 times what you should have done um, is uh, very quickly going to be an issue. Whereas with Makes double, sense. you don't have that. You don't have that problem. Big decimal, you don't have that problem either. Mm -hmm. There, there is a follow-up question or comment on that. Uh, it says, "But that annotations protect you on the compiler level." Yeah, I'd be interested to see how they do that. Um, uh, it, it may because go to some way to the, protect you. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, good test mm -hmm. coverage will also protect you. <laughs> but um, I don't know. It um, you would have to have a lot of confidence that that um, will do do the job for you. I think. Um, maybe for the person who asked the question, you could uh, point to just like some annotations or libraries that would uh, provide that. And we have another question regarding the enum example, um, unless you wanted to yeah. comment uh, some more on this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, when you create a new instance of enum with unsafe, do you fix enum dot value off or enum maps that may still have an, a fixed size array under the hood or any other cached uh, enum values? Correct. So um, when you, if you, so if you change a field, it's not a problem because enums are stored by um, all objects are stored by reference. So when you change that single reference, it is apparent to everything else. Um, however, um, as as you as you mentioned, if you add an enum, the built-in enum map and set don't support um, uh, adding or changing the size. Um, and um, we, I considered going down that road, but it just seemed a bit too magical. Um, it's already quite magical having dynamic enums, having e uh, changing the code of enum sets and maps to support uh, the possibility that an enum uh, value could turn up um, is is even more so. Um, one of the um, reasons for that is is actually um, enum set dot all of. So um, say you say uh, you want a collection, which is all of an enum, right? But then uh, you add an enum after that set is created, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you need to remember that this is an all of enum. So, um, so the behavior we have is that it's an all of enum. Uh, we remember that it was created as all of, and then record which ones are not present which ones have been removed. So that if any turn up after they're created, they're implicitly already in there. Um, but, um, and that, that behavior is not in, in built in. And we'd have to change the code uh, in lots of ways that um, it's just, it's not worth, it's not worth the risk that that could cause some unintended consequence. It just feels like something that is going to bite you at some point if, you, if we added that behavior. I mean, we, 
I've certainly considered it, we might do it in the future. So instead we have our own uh, equivalent for enum set and map, which is uh, created through a factory method. So you don't really need to know what its implementation is and we could change it later. Mm -hmm. So you just need to make sure that you don't uh, call the usual dot values a method or an usual enum set, right? Or getting all yes, enums if you if you want the ability to add uh, enums, if you want to change them, uh, their fields associated with that, that still all works fine. Okay, great. And uh, that questionnaire um, followed up with uh, LMX Exchange IntelliJ Lint, uh, a GitHub link to an annotation processor of the um, long example for a calculation. So maybe we can check cool. that out later. I'd, I'd be very interested in that. Part. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I think we can continue for now with the content. Sure. So we have um, another thing that we use is um, the ability to create um, unique timestamps. Now, this is uh, really about um, ID generation, unique ID generation. However, we also want the ability for it to record and follow the wall clock. Um, so this has two advantages. One is that um, uh, it, it effectively encodes in a timestamp so that you get a bit of additional information in the sense that um, it tells you when this was created. But it also means that if you do something like failover or restart, um, there's, no, there's no real state that needs to be recorded. As long as the machines involved are reasonably in sync um, as in, they are no more. One is no more behind than than the amount of time it takes to fail over. Uh, in other words, by the time it fails over, uh, the clock is still ahead of when the previous machine failed. Um, then um, the time the timestamps will still be monotonically increasing, uh, without requiring any other synchronization between the machines. So. Um, um, the other thing is that uh, we want it to be unique for an entire machine if possible. And so what that's what this does, is it creates some shared memory that's accessible to um, every process running as a particular user. So we, we do put some protection there um, for users, uh, but the assumption is that uh, if you're running a whole lot of suite of microservices, they're all running as the same user in reality. And um, it can extract timestamps out of it which um, when I wrote this, exa um, this slide, it was a unique for microsecond timestamps. We also now have support for uniqueness for nanotimes as well. Um, so that um, if you're using the nanotimestamp, it will be unique, um, but also have a nanosecond resolution. Um, uh, so yeah, so we've got uh, the ability to add failover and uniqueness across a, a single machine um, and um, record a timestamp all in, the, uh, in a single number. And it's, um, it's about, it's not quite 64 bit, it's about uh, 56, 57 bit. Now you can reduce this by moving EGPOC to like something recent, like the start of the year or start of the week. But it, um, if you're using nanotime in particular, it quickly uses up a large portion of the bits. So, um, you know, it, it's difficult to try and get this kind of functionality with um, a 32-bit um, ID. But uh, with 64-bit ID, it's not a it's not a problem. Um, so it does have the downside. The IDs could be a little bit longer than you might like, but um, it does it does pack a, a lot of information into a, um, a small number. So, uh, so you might be wondering, well, what do you do if you've got multiple machines? Well, in this case, what we do is we add, um, we can add some either some extra bits to the 64-bit number uh, to uh, signify the host ID, or if it's been turned into a string, then um, we can encode that string with a, um, we've got a number of encoders for writing longs in, in different bases, like base 85 or um, base 32, 64, 128, 256. And um, it can be written as a, a, a fairly compact string. 
And then we add to the start of that, and it's typically the start, one or two characters to signify the source of that, um, that ID. So you can very quickly see from an ID uh, where, where did it come from. And um, that may actually be different even for, you know, be down to the microservice level. So different microservices, even on the same machine, may have their own IDs, even though that's not strictly required just to get a unique uh, ID because the timestamp alone will be unique across a single machine. So, um, anyone have any questions about this? Uh, may Not I ask for now. a small mm -hmm. question? Uh, do we measure any sure. performance overhead for calling current time micros met method? Yes, it's um, it's around um, depends on the machine, but it's around thirty to fifty um, nanoseconds. Okay, I see. Uh, um, it looks like we have no more questions, so okay. let's move forward. Okay, so um, <laughs> this one, I've what interests me about this one is it's a it's a collection which is a cache. Um, so the purpose of the cache is that it um, um, acts as an object pool for char sequences, such as a string builder, which might have been deserialized in, you know, you've got some data deserialized it into a string builder and you want to turn it into a string and you want to use an object pool that doesn't just grow endlessly um, for uh, doing a reasonably good job at caching it. Um, the thing that's unusual about it is that this is a collection that can be shared across threads without requiring any explicit thread safety. So there's no locks, there's no synchronized, there's no volatile, none of that is required. Uh, and yet this collection behaves uh, appropriately. Um, and it is in fact uh, entirely uh, a possible and still you still get correct behavior if, for example, the interna array has in the same location different um, string references um, that will still behave um, uh, correctly uh, as expected. Um, and there may even be a, an advantage in uh, multiple threads having different views of that array because uh, it may be a, a more localized uh, appropriate um, cache. Um, so um, I haven't come across any other collections like this where um, I guess partly because it's a best effort based collection, um, but I haven't come across any other collections like this where um, you don't need any explicit um, thread safety uh, to be used concurrently between threads. Any questions about that? Not for now. Okay. All right, I'll move on. Um, another thing that we do is we um, we do actually document uh, when we get uh, runtime exceptions. And we'd like that documentation to be correct, as in um, not documenting that you might get a runtime exception when you don't, uh, but also say you could get a runtime exception in this situation when we do. Um, obviously, uh, we don't necessarily expect or want our developers to have to handle a checked exception, but we do at least want our documentation to be uh, correct. So how do we do that? Um, well, one simple trick we do is I have, um, we only have a few runtime exceptions that we use or that are parents of runtime exceptions that we use. And um, so we have some implementations that just extend um, exception rather than runtime exception. And um, by adding that into the class path before the, um, the actual libraries, the system libraries, um, the compiler thinks these are now runtime except uh, compile time exceptions, uh, checked exceptions. And uh, so then as we go to compile the code, it will show up, uh, does it say throws? Uh, does uh, Javadoc have in it uh, an exception that never actually gets thrown? 
Um, do we have a try catch block for an illegal estate exception when an illegal estate exception never actually gets thrown? Um, that's one of the interesting consequences when I first did this is that there was a lot of code which would say try catch illegal estate exception and then it would just say ignored. And then when I actually put this in, it showed that, well, actually it's never thrown in the first place. So um, it was uh, quite comforting to just go through and remove all of that um, uh, code that is pro probably for historical reasons that it could have been thrown in the past, but is no longer being thrown and ignored anyway. So, um, so that's uh, one of the things that we do on an ad hoc basis. Um, it's not something that's done in, by routine, but we have a, a little sub module um, that I can include um, uh, when I wanted to, um, to do this check manually. Interesting. I have a question on that actually, because this uh, checking the documentation or making sure that the documentation is correct, um, it sounds like something that uh, static code analysis could do, right? Um, Instead potentially, of having yes. something like... Yes, potentially it could. It could do. Um, you could do static code analysis that essentially treated a runtime exception as a as a checked exception. Doesn't cause a compile time failure, but just says, "Hey, you're you're um, you've forgotten to document that there's this uh, un unchecked exception, or uh, you're trying to catch an unchecked exception when it never gets thrown anyway, or you've documented that mm -hmm. it could be thrown." But in reality, it never does. Makes sense, yeah. And we have another and, and question. And these are things that chat. evolve over mm -hmm. time. These are things that evolve over time. Like it might have been in the past, this was correct. But in the meantime, we've removed uh, um, all the code paths that might ever produce this check, unchecked exception. And so why is it still documented? Yes, right. I think that then it would be something like a little bit more sophisticated process to do the static code analysis, right? And and run that continuously, maybe as part of your build to see does the Java doc or whatever documentation match the expected code paths, right? Mm. Well, it doesn't need to be the runtime code path. You can still do what the compiler does and be kind of um, mm -hmm. cautious about it. Oh, that seems to work just fine. So you just effectively treat it as if it were a checked exception. But obviously, when it's this library is delivered to the end users, they aren't forced to treat it as a checked exception. Makes sense. Huh? And we have another question on the chat uh, related to strings. Do you have uh, your own implementation of uh, strings? Sort of. Um, so we have our own um, implementation called Bytes, and Bytes uh, extends char sequence. Uh, Bytes can be on heap or off heap. It can be memory mapped, it can be shared, and it uh, is mutable. And it can be, it supports thread safe construction um, uh, attributes. It can also be, have a 64 bit long size. So, um, it um, has a number of features that um, string doesn't have, uh, for better or worse. Um, however, we do use strings quite a lot, and which is why, and certainly our clients like using strings as well. So we, even when we have alternatives, um, in many cases, um, using an object pool like this is sufficient. Um, so. Um, so that it's not actually worth using like a mutable um, structure to avoid um, garbage being created. Because um, one of the key things is that even though we are low, G we want to be very low GC, it doesn't have to be zero GC. So for example, say you've got an Eden size of 24 gig, you can produce a gigabyte an hour and not have a minor collection for a whole 24 hours. So a gigabyte an hour is still still a decent amount of objects uh, for a single process to produce, especially when you have lots of microservices, because each one of them can be producing that much um, and still have no GC. So, um, so we're not necessarily looking for zero GC. We just want it to be so low that um, the, uh, the, 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 when you do have a GC, it's, it's uh, extremely rare or it's 
managed or there's very low overhead. Makes sense. And no other questions for now. Sure. Um, so this one is not uh, such a, well, this one is uh, something I think is a poorly used feature, it's a feature that's not used often enough, and that is um, uh, a class value. So class value is actually added in Java 7. And what it is, it's a bit like thread local, but it's for classes instead of for threads so that you can uh, associate a piece of data with a class and that class um, um, and that data is retired when that class is unloaded um, and um, but it also um, it, it gets set at most once so it has a, a number of nice features for caching uh, metadata that you've derived from classes so Say, for example, you want to, in this example, is you want to cache what is the read resolve method, and you want to leave it in a state where it can be, you're sure it can be called, and it won't call the security. Um, um, even if it's public, you may want to turn off security because uh, it will still do the security check even if it's always accessible. So if you turn off accessibility, you can, in many cases, halve the overhead of doing the method call, even if it's, you know it's public. Um, so we generally just turn off, um, when we're using reflection like this, we just turn off the, um, the security check. Um, in this case, it has to be. Um, generally, read resolve is not public anyway. Um, so, uh, so, what, so, this is, so Java 7 obviously doesn't have support for lambdas, so we've just added a class, which is a bit like, again, like thread local, has a with initial where you can take a lambda and that lambda uh, defines um, how to initialize um, um, a ver uh, a, some cache data associated with a class. Um, so a, a lot of our serialization and deserialization uses this heavily. It's quite a lot of caching of how to serialize and deserialize objects and um, access fields and so on. Any questions, no questions on this? that? No sure. questions. Um, another thing that we use is um, what's called uh, vacacious, uh, vac vacacious exceptions. And that means an exception that just is thrown freely. And um, so we'll do this. Um, so we, we have uh, support for lambdas which can throw exceptions. We've got, uh, we use those. But in many cases, you're calling libraries that don't have that support built in. Um, they assume that there is no um, checked exception. And um, so what, what, this is one of the, the use cases where we will rethrow a checked exception as if it was unchecked. Uh, this is the nice feature that you can still catch it as the original exception. You don't have to wrap it, catch the wraps exception, and then unwrap it again. You can just catch it as the exception that was actually thrown. Um, and um, and that way um, you can, um, it, it simplifies your code uh, in that situation. So we, we do use in a number of places um, this rethrow method, which allows us to um, throw a, a checked exception as if it were unchecked. Uh, so here's, here's an example where we turn one into the other. So in this case, we've got a, a throwing exception which is checked that expects a checked exception, um, and uh, which we can catch and then rethrow as if it were unchecked. Um, this is a little bit. I mean, you have to be aware that you're doing this, and it only really makes sense if you're writing both the code that's throwing the checked exception and the code you expect to catch it with. Um, you wouldn't want to be throwing checked exceptions all the way out to um, some other party or uh, someone is using your code, that would definitely confuse people. Um, I mean, you, you'd you still be able to work it out from the stack trace, but that it will confuse people to um, see uh, checked exceptions being thrown at them that um, are not declared in, say, a throws method. Um, but it is very easy to do that. All you need to do um, to 
start treating it as a checked exception again is to add it to the throws clause of a method. Um, because you can add things to the throws clause, which you which the compiler can't determine you actually threw. It's not a requirement. So as soon as you add it to a calling method in a throws clause, you can now catch it naturally. Sounds good. I have uh, one comment just uh, because I, w when I read this first, I was wondering how do you pronounce this word again? Back vacuous vacuous um um vacacious vac vacuous i'm i'm vacuous. not sure to be honest <laughs> yeah because vacuous well, well i'm right. not a native speaker in in english so for anybody who's wondering uh, like i was wondering it basically means empty or blank if i get it right uh yes for this exception and I have a question. Do you think this would actually uh, be like a nice to have feature for Java in general? So when I think about something like streams or combination with lambdas right. where you could otherwise not? Well, with streams, what they should have done is to have um, these this throwing consumers. So uh, have, have um, to inherit from interfaces that implicitly uh, know that they can throw a checked exception, right? And then it all gets handled appropriately. Um, so that if you throw a checked exception inside a Lambda, then that checked exception is, you can put that in a try catch clause around the stream, right? Um, right. Uh, and and then if you write Lambdas using these, that that's that's the behavior you get. I I do know that there was a, a pretty fierce internal debate, and my understanding is that at, at one point they they were actually supporting it that way, but I think they decided that that was. Um, I think there's the, I mean a lot of Java developers don't actually like checked exceptions, <laughs> as it is, um, and um, uh, in, increasing support for it they seem to be reluctant to do. Um, that was just my impression anyway. No, I uh, can second that out. Yeah. yeah, so, um, and, and I can understand that. So that's why, uh, if you do this, you should use it pretty cautiously, but there are certain situations where, um, the alternatives are gen, in my opinion, uglier than doing this. So, um, we do also have, um, having said that, we do also have an IO runtime exception. That was the most common checked exception that we were throwing. Um, or uh, having to wrap was um, an IO exception. So we, in many cases, wrap it with an IO runtime exception because we feel that that is the clearest for how it's going to be used. So this rethrow really is only when you, in in calling code, you expect to be able to catch it sometimes in the same method, um, uh, but you don't want to have to put in um, something quite ugly to make that all work. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. No other questions for now. Yeah, let's move forward. Sure. So I mentioned earlier that um, if you try and take a stack trace, but also a lot of profilers, um, will only take stack traces or stack samples where um, there's a safe point. Now, theoretically, there's a safe point between every bytecode instruction. However, obviously, that's not efficient to be checking uh, for safe points uh, between every instruction. So the JVM does its best to remove them. Uh, and it has a whole lot of heuristics about when it removes it or doesn't remove it. However, um, you don't really have much control over that. So it can remove them too much to the point where you've got sections of code which are very difficult to work out what are, where the time was being spent uh, because all the safe points got removed. And so you can end up getting code being blamed uh, because that's the first safe point that it hit that had nothing to do with where the time is being spent. So it might be something quite in, indirect or innocuous. Uh, I remember one application I was profiling where the third biggest hitter, the third most expensive thing was um, integer.hashcode. And if you have a look at the code for integer.hashcode, it doesn't take you long to work out. That's not going to take a long time. Um, 
So uh, it took me a while to work out why why was it blaming integer.hash code? And it was because that was there was a safe point being left there and that was the first one that was being hit. Um, even though that was nothing to do with what was actually the cause of my performance issue. So, um, so in Java 8, there's a method um, which does nothing, but it, it uses JNI called um, compiler.enable. Uh, and because it uses um, JNI, it um, adds a save point, uh, even though it doesn't do anything. Now, um, for some reason, they thought this was a method worth optimizing in Java 9. And so now it's optimized explicitly that this method genuinely does nothing. It doesn't even add a safe point. However, there's a, another way of triggering a safe point, which only works in Java 9 plus, which is to um, uh, do a check against what looks like a volatile. Um, um, but because it's trivial, it, um, it optimizes away. And then all that's left is the safe point. Um, so this this loop uh, it actually takes only about one nanosecond in reality, um, despite like it looks like it's doing a lot more. Um, and so it's it that that loop is faster than the uh, JNI method enable, which does nothing. It's quite a bit faster actually. Um, so um, yeah, this is a bit of an oddity. So any question about safe points? Not for now. I'm just, uh, yeah, it's just interesting that this, this works with the for loop. That's, yeah. Cool. Yes. Yeah. All right. So um, another thing that we do is we use, make use of the hint in Java 9, which um, allows you to tell a loop that it's not, um, that it, it's busy waiting. So we do have a number of busy waiting loops and we don't want it to loop and roll and you get better, uh, you can get better outcomes if you give it a hint to say, well, this is, this is a loop that's, it's actually a, a busy waiting loop. It's a spin loop. We, we don't want it to do loop unrolling and um, all the other things. And um, we do want it to pause the CPU before redoing whatever it was in a tight loop doing. Um, it's interesting that the, the JVM is smart enough to cut down a lot of this code down to almost nothing. Um, uh, so SafePoint itself does 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 a bit of code. Um, the invoke exact is notionally doing reflection, and there's a try catch block around it. All of that compiles right down to um, next to nothing, which is pretty impressive of the JVM. Uh, it's, there's next to nothing in terms of the overhead, other than what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, we actually have a question uh, regarding the safe point example. Um, question asks, if we force such uh, safe points, would be the downside uh, code remove some of the initial safe points? Um, mm, well, I mean, if you manually add safe points, um, it is possible that you could add them where it will end up leaving them anyway. Um, and it will slow down your code marginally. Um, so for example, compiler.enable adds about five nanoseconds and savepoint.force adds about one nanosecond. Um, so it's, it's not zero, but in many cases, uh, when you're trying to diagnose a problem, um, or have something that, um, allows you to, uh, have better clarity as to what the application is doing in production. So you're, You've got something that's production-like, and you run, say, a flight recorder, uh, but you're you're not getting good quality information as to where the time is actually being spent. Um, adding in a sprinkling of save points can be quite helpful. Um, uh, yeah, so an example of that is that sometimes we'll put this before and after a synchronized block to make it clearer um, as to whether a thread was waiting for the lock to be acquired or not. I just, give you a bit more of a hint. Uh, I just want to mention that we have uh, a you know small maybe fifteen seconds delay between the uh, uh, between the actual life and um, t uh, so, uh, so it takes some time 
uh, to deliver the broadcast to our audience. So <laughs> sometimes when they ask for questions, um, uh, people just start typing something and that's why we receive some questions a, a minute after uh, you ask the audience uh, for some questions. So this is small announce for the audience. Just don't wait for Peter when he announced that do we have questions or not. Just type your questions in the chat during uh, Peter's presentation and in the next post uh, our experts will ask them to Peter. So that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm happy to go back. It's not, it's not a problem. Um, we're we're nearly done for slides, so um, uh, I, we, we should um, we won't be running out of time. So this is in fact the last slide. So um, so one of the things that we do is uh, because we've got libraries and we want to make sure the libraries produce appropriate error messages uh, and not produce messages that they shouldn't produce uh, in terms of writing to logging or the console. We actually have um, a, a wrapper for that which we can change programmatically. So it's called an exception handler. So we can track in certain tests um, what what error messages were logged and um, maybe do something like um, check, uh, does it have um, the right words in it uh, with the contains or um, does it produce the right number of exceptions? Or in most cases, what we're all we're looking for is does it produce no exceptions? Um, and that's not always obvious because many of our tests are multi-threaded. So a background thread may trigger an exception uh, and we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so uh, a common one um, which can come up is uh, uh, a background thread complains that a resource was discarded without being closed. Um, that will cause the test to fail even though it occurs in a background thread and it doesn't change the behavior of the test but the test uh, is clearly exercising code that's not releasing resources properly. So we've got this ability to capture um, uh, background uh, and, and anything that's logged or worn. Um, um, and um, so uh, in addition to that, I've got a novel one, which I think is, which is partly mostly for my amusement, which is that uh, when an exception is thrown, it goes and collects some interesting information and then tries to um, open a URL in your desktop, uh, a Google search or a Stack Overflow search of the exception uh, and the version of Java you're running. And um, so uh, that way it will just, like an exception gets thrown in your program, it just throws up on your screen um, and it, it just saves you having to search for what does this exception mean yourself. Um, the most useful bit, as I mentioned, is uh, being able to um, track um, you know, um, our, our, our sections of code producing the only the uh, messages that they should do. No questions on this so far. Okay, well, I'll move on to the next slide, right now. which is which is questions. So, um, uh, so yes, I'm open to any questions now. Uh, it doesn't have to be so what I've we talked about. It can be about. Type. It can be about Java in general, trading systems, whatever. Unsafe. So we had a previous uh, question as a follow-up question before for the uh, var handle, which I don't know if you uh, know how, how to answer. So the question was, uh, eventually, do you think it will never be done to migrate to var handles? Um, was the follow-up question when you answered about the uh, issue with Java uh, 8 uh, versus 11 and so on? Yeah, I think um, uh, var handles will be, um, it's probably the way to go ultimately, but I think it will take a long time before we go get off uh, unsafe entirely because it's, it's not just var handles are the sorts of things we use it for. We use it for some other things as well, and there'll need to be replacements for all of that. Um, falling short of that, we would have to use JNI as a as an alternative because everything you can do in unsafe you can do via JNI. It's just not as efficient, and you would have to add a a shared library to add the functionality, which at the moment we don't need to do. Um, so that's that's possibly uh, what will happen. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's, it's, there's a slight irony that method handles not only do methods, but they also do fields. And var handles not only do objects, they also do methods. <laughs> so it's just a matter of um, uh, when they were added to the JVM as to whether it's a method handle or a var handle. Let me ask And we have one question. question. Mm -hmm. Please go um, a small uh, question. Peter, uh, which uh, features of language would you add to Java to be to make Java uh, faster than C++ or C? To make Java great again. Yep. <laughs> yes. I think, I mean, on the basis of this talk, I think the biggest thing that's missing is uh, direct language support for a decimal. Um, that would make a big difference to how we recommend people code our applications. Um, and it would give uh, double a run for its money. Um, I, one of the things I miss from C is actually type def, um, where you can wrap a primitive so that you, um, say you have a double that's a quantity and a double that's a price. Uh, and you want to make sure that you never multiply two prices together. You never multiply two quantities together. You never pass in a price as a quantity or vice versa. Um, at the moment, you have to wrap that with an object or a record, and it becomes much more heavyweight. Um, uh, just just being able to do simple checking uh, on that level would be would be nice. And again, it would change the way we recommend things be coded. Um, in terms of performance. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, it's interesting. If you have a look at the TOB in index, um, the um, only recently Java dropped to third. It's been it's held the top position for a very long time, and I think part of that is um, uh, a lack of uh, excitement about new features in a new version. So Java always its interest always waned before the next release, and then a new release would come out, and everyone's googling, "Oh, how do I do this?" And then suddenly the interest goes back up again. So I think when Java 17 comes out, there will be a renewed interest. And I fully expect Java will become the top of that list again. But um, if you look at the languages in the top uh, 10, um, only two of them are newer than Java, uh, that being C Sharp and um, another one, which escapes me right now. Uh, but um, and uh, the ones that are around it are uh, the ones that are currently above it are C and Python, which are older languages. C in particular has has less features than Java in many ways. Um, so um, um, this is not necessarily it's not necessarily about adding more features. I think it's more about doing what it does well and being very easy to do that. Um, is is the is the most important thing. Uh, if you look at the languages that are much more feature rich, much more cooler, more popular amongst developers, um, they're they're way down on the list, unfortunately, um, in many ways. Oh, and okay, I think so that's... Peter, uh, I'm sure. very sorry we have only a limited amount of time. Have to sure. close the day. So uh, uh, I think that's all our attendees. I uh, want to join uh, you and Sergey and Sebastian in Zoom discussion. Sure. So just as a talk, if you have talked to Peter. So uh, again, we have uh, some side effects related to stream delays. <laughs> uh, it's not was variable that it's okay to write uh, some questions uh, during uh, Peter's speech. So uh, all this is uh, for all of attendees, you guys, folks. Uh, just push the Zoom button just under the player and join the discussion in Zoom right now. And what I want to say at the very end of the talk is thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for joining us. Uh, if I understand correct, this is your second Joker, correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, the first one was in St. Petersburg, physically, not yes. virtually, about five uh, years ago, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, no, thank you. fun memories. Yeah, thank you very much, Sergey, for joining us, and thank you, Sebastian, for all your contribution to our conference, especially the Joker and JPoint. That's amazing. Thank you very, very much, uh, gentlemen, thank and uh, uh, see you in Zoom in a minute. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.